The good, the good, the good. The good, I hear you. I don't want some other people give me a little <laughs> shout out. All right, I hear one more person. Good. Um, <laughs> is is Pat Daly on? Yes, yes. Hi, David. Hi, Pat. Nice to hear you. Yes, thank you. Are you a Jamaican again? Is that it? Always a Jamaican. <laughs> You told me you've been here since June, so I was wondering what happened for years so long. Anyway, yes. it's, good, it's good, good to have you. Thank and um, all other persons on, the, uh, on this session, we are happy that you're here. Yannick, you asked a very good question on Sunday. I hope other people will feel free to ask questions, you know, as we move forward. And it is the certain way, the sure way of us learning as we go on. For those of you who follow football, please do not look at the color of my jersey and think that I support Manchester City. I do not. It's the wrong side of Manchester. Okay? But it is what it is. It's good to be with you. So here goes. We wanna I wanna share my PowerPoint with you. I'm gonna stop sharing my I mean close my camera for the time being, my video. Okay, and then I'm gonna share my PowerPoint. And what we're doing is that we're continuing the session that we started on Sunday. I don't know if you all have viewed that session from Sunday, but I was very, very aware that it, it seemed a little strange that we would begin a survey of the Old Testament by looking at a New Testament passage. We looked at Luke 24. And what I was really concerned about was how Jesus spoke of the Old Testament to his, to two of his disciples and how his speaking of the Old Testament brought so much joy to them as he showed how the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish Bible, made reference to him. I mentioned that the, the designation of the Old Testament is a Christian designation, not a Jewish designation. So out of respect for Jews, we really should say, um, possible Jews who might be in our company, we really should say, we should always qualify to say the Jewish Bible, okay? Or the Hebrew scriptures, Hebrew Bible, Hebrew scriptures. We should always say that out of respect for Jews because the truth is that when we speak of the Old Testament, a lot of people have a misunderstanding of what it means. It's almost, it's almost a disparaging kind of, of way of speaking of the Bible in the minds of some people because it's old. And then we use a passage from Hebrews that it is obsolete. And so some Christians believe that the Old Testament is no longer relevant to us. And that is so sad because that's not what what was meant when we whoever it was came for the idea of the old testament it just means old covenant as opposed to new covenant and the old covenant is important because from the old covenant we get to appreciate a new covenant even more we really can't appreciate a new covenant as much as we ought to unless we fully understand where it's coming from with the old covenant so the, so the new covenant doesn't doesn't replace or doesn't displace the old covenant, it fulfills it. So you had a scholar like Augustine who said, the old, the new is in the old concealed and the old is in the new revealed. When we look at the New Testament and see how the Old Testament is fulfilled in it, then we get a greater appreciation for the New Testament and from the heritage in which it is coming from. Okay, so I was very fascinated by the statement of Jesus that the, that the the Jewish Bible, beginning with Moses and the prophets, spoke to, spoke about him. And later on, later on in in, in that same passage in Luke twenty four, about verse fourteen or fifty odd, it said the the, the law the prophets and the writings, the entire Old Testament speaks of Jesus. So today, I'm gonna to stop sharing my, my video now, but I'm gonna open my screen 
for you to see my PowerPoint. And when you see the PowerPoint, I just want you to tell me that you're seeing it. Are you seeing it? Yes. Okay, great. So I have about 15 or so slides. I want to go through them as quickly as I can, but at the same time, I don't want to go too quickly to, to, to kind of miss out on important information. So David, please, there's another screen open, David, that is that, is that you or just me? I, which other screen are you seeing? Oh, maybe it's me, all right, sorry, David. Yeah. Anybody else seen two screens? No. Okay, great. Go ahead. Says you, Jeremy. Yes. All right. So, um, please feel free to stop me if you need anything to be clarified. And then we still try to have a session at the end, a question and answer session. Okay. So, we're dealing with a general introduction and overview of the Pentateuch. And I decided that I would just quickly go over some, some of what we spoke about on Sunday regarding the makeup of the, of the Jewish Bible. But well, here goes. Ooh. So, we begin by talking about the Torah. You should all know what the Torah is, right? The Torah is the Hebrew word for law. In terms of the Hebrew Bible, the word speaks of the first five books, often called the Law of Moses. Okay, so we're going to come, we're going to look a little bit more about these things. However, Torah eventually went on to speak of the entire Hebrew Bible, which is the Christian Old Testament, simply because it was the foundation of the entire volume. Okay, uh, what we mean by that is that each division of the Hebrew Bible was purposefully was a purposeful commentary on the importance of the law for daily living. So if you um, think about it carefully, you would see that the oh, in the uh, you'll see that the, the Torah or the first five books of the Hebrew Bible kind of laid down the laws for living, while in the and, and so that came from the lawgiver Moses. But then when you go into the the historical books. You know, or the, what, the, what the Hebrew Bible call the prophets, you'll see where these guys are what we call covenant enforcers. They were like the, the function very much like what we call pastors today, who were asking people to live according to the law. And then when you go into the writings of the poetic books, it's like the common man who is singing his songs of worship. You know, much like our praise and worship leaders today, again, all of what they are saying is based on the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. But as I said, the word eventually came at some time to speak of the entire Old Testament, right? Among traditional Jews, that number is wrong. It's not 39 books. Okay, I'll correct that. No, I see it, it flat on my head. It's 20 odd books. Among traditional Jews, the Torah, the Torah, mean the, the the Hebrew Bible consisted of, um, consisted of I think it's about twenty four, but I'll tell you books which roughly corresponded to the thirty nine books of the Christian Old Testament. Okay, because what we see happening, and, and I'm I'm looking for the information that as I speak to you, but what we see happening um, is that some of the books of our Old Testament, our designation of the Old Testament, um, we separate them into two. While in the Hebrew Bible, they are one book, like um, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, and so on. They are each one book in the Jewish Testament. I'll give me one second. 24, David. 24. I think it's a, I think it's 24. It's supposed to be 24. But we want to see them anyway, right? So that needs to be corrected. Just confuse me when I saw it. Right? And another name they, that is used for the Jewish Bible is the Tanakh. And you're going to see, you're going to see a little bit later on why it's called the Tanakh. I'm not going to tell you right now. All right? 
Now, we don't speak of the Torah as much as we speak of the Pentateuch when we are speaking of the first five books in the Bible. Okay, Pentateuch means five books. Okay, it speaks of the same five books of Moses as the Torah, and the name is the name given as a designation of part of the Old Testament under Greece's Hellenization process. Um, this is something that we perhaps will talk about later on tonight, but. The, the designation of the Old Testament as we have it came about by the Greek Alexander the Great sometime in about 330 BC, thereabouts. And um, we can explain it a little bit more, right? So let's look at what we're talking about in a more graphic form. The Hebrew and the Greek classifications of the biblical books that are the books of the what we call the Old Testament. So here goes. The Hebrew Bible was originally divided into three sections, and this is what I said on Sunday, right? So you had the Torah, which is the law. You had the Nevi'im, which is the prophets. And you have the Kethuvim, which is the writings. We're going to look at some of those a little bit. We're going to look at, I mean, a little bit from now, we're going to go in details about what those are. The Greek classification is divided into four sections, not three sections, but four sections, right? The Pentateuch, the historical books. Can anybody tell me one of the other two? I'm waiting to hear. Anybody knows of the other one, of the, one or the two other designation, designations? Writings. The who? Of what, David? What are the other two, um, two sections in the in our understanding of the Bible? The major and the minor prophets. Okay, the well, the poetic books and the prophetic books. Okay, the prophetic books are divided into the poetic and I mean the major and the minor prophets. So we just uh, divide them. And we make a slight distinction between the wisdom literature and the, the wisdom books and the poetic books, even though they're all poetic books. But we'll talk a little bit more about those as the series goes along, right? So I want you to look at those, the two different classifications. If you look at the Hebrew Bible, you will see the classifications are a little bit different, all right? Oh, Apart from the classifications being different, you're going to find that the book order, the, the order of the books in the in the Hebrew Bible, is sometimes a little bit different from the order in our Bibles. One of the most amazing ones is that the Book of Ruth doesn't fall in the historical books in the in the Jewish Bible. The Book of Ruth fall, Ruth falls among the writings. Writings the poetic or the wisdom kinds of books. It is designated there. Okay? And that has been a kind of a, a question that people have asked for a while as to why that is so. We are not exactly certain as to why it is so, but the book appears in a different section, as does Esther, I think. Okay. So let's move on. Now, I want to... Tonight, what we are focusing on is the first five books. And because we have such a short time over these eight sessions, we have to do, we, are, we have to do these um, things relatively quickly. This is just an overview, right? So this is a thematic overview of the first five books. Can someone tell me the name of the first five books based on the Jewish designation? What's the big name that is called, the first five books that are called, based on the Jewish designation? The Torah. The Torah. What, according to the English Bible, what do we call them? Pentateuch. Pentateuch. Okay, great. So this is a thematic overview of the first five books of the Bible. First of all, let's look at some important Pentateuchal ideas and themes. 
So there are three big concepts that we'll see taking place throughout these first five books. We see culture playing a very prominent role. And we're talking about culture. We see an evolving Jewish culture in these first five books. The Jews don't come about as a nation until Abraham comes. So that's Genesis 12. But we see over time this evolution of a culture among the Jews. And this becomes an extremely important point for us to remember because since the Bible was written at a different age, at a different time, okay, the things that were written were written within particular cultural contexts. If we don't understand those contexts, then we won't understand the word. So for instance, let me give you a for instance. You are going to encounter a strange practice like Sarah giving her handmaid to her husband, that is Abraham, that he could sleep with her to have a child, okay? And that child, when he was born, would not be considered to be the child of Sarah, the child of Hagar, right? She is worse than a surrogate mother, mother, less than a surrogate mother, okay? Because in, in, um, in our context, a surrogate mother still has rights over a child, right? You have to sign away those rights. In Jewish culture, of that day, the slave woman, the concubine that she became, she became like a half-wife. She had no rights over the child that she bore for her, for the for the for the husband, for her, the gentleman she was forced to have a child with. We call that a the term, that aspect is called a leveret marriage. Okay. And if we don't understand that, we are constantly left in the dark as to what is happening. So as we go through, there are these cultural elements that are coming to the fore that we have to stop to try to understand, okay? We have to try to understand those things because they are not necessarily the same as us. Now, I'm not suggesting that because it's a person's culture that is right. Because I think one of the things that you're going to see throughout the scriptures is that there are some cultural practices that are pronounced wrong, even if the word doesn't say this is wrong. The clear illustration from the Bible is that they are indeed wrong and are to be rejected. Okay, take the practice of polygamy, for instance. In the Old Testament, in, in Genesis chapter 2, the basis of monogamy is laid down. The man shall leave his mother and father, and she, he shall cleave with his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That is the basis of monogamy. But then we see polygamy practiced throughout the Old Testament, and yet still almost every time that the writers of the Old Testament seem to tear down the practice because of the problem that comes in family um, with polygamy. Okay? So it is... Not because that cultural practice means that it is an acceptable practice. Another big concept is a concept of creation. And here is a very, very huge deal for the Jews. They have a very, um, they have this consciousness of the fact that the world is created by God. And because the world is created by God, it is a special place. It is a special place, and human beings are special people. Now, this is one of the anomalies among the Jews, is that they have this such high view of creation and people, yet still they went on in their cultural practices to look down on others. Okay? So you're going to see this kind of a dual emphasis on creation coming out. One, that creation is by God, it is good, it is special, Genesis chapter 1 and so on. But at the same time, God's people's understanding of creation seems to be a little bit off. 
right? And that perhaps could also be said about character. What makes the Old Testament so important is its emphasis on the character of God's people. Very flawed character. Yet still, what we see happening is that we understand the, the flawedness, if there's such a word, the flawedness of their character because they are constantly being set along the background of the character of the God of the Jews. Okay, the character of God shines through in the Old Testament or in the whole Bible, but since we're focused on the Old Testament, that's what happens. And so one of the most profound pieces of advice I heard many years ago from my brother Delano Palmer is that every time you read the Old Testament and the Bible, you ask the question, what does it teach me about God? The character of God shines through these stories. And I suspect if we do not look at the stories of the Old Testament like that, what is it saying about God as being the first and of the, and the primary importance, then we are going to miss the importance of the stories. Okay, so there are three big concepts I mentioned. Now, the, the key idea in the Pentateuch is how the story of the, of the people of the world, how it moves from creation, or God moves from creation to the chosen of Israel, then it moves into their taken away into slavery, and then it ends with their deliverance. Creation choosing, slavery, deliverance. That's a kind of a nice way in which you can put the whole five books together. Okay? And there are seven key people. I should have asked you who they are without showing you. I don't know if you said them before. You must have seen them. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses. Is there anybody you think I left out? That's key. No. <laughs> Um, Obed, not Obed. What's that? I don't hear that. Not hear that comment. Now, I know some of you have become woke in recent really? times. The woke people might ask a question. Are women not key in the story? Can you tell me the name of some important women in the first five books of the Old Testament? Sarah. Sarah. Um, Sarah. Rebecca. Eve. Rebecca. Eve. Eve. Um, Rebecca. Rachel. Rachel. Um, Deborah. Zipporah. Okay. Ruth. No, not in the first five books. Ruth isn't in the first five. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, what is interesting is that the seven key people are all men because of the culture of the day. In the culture of the day, women take a backseat to men. But that doesn't mean that they don't play important parts in the development of the story. Eve plays a very important part in the development of the story. As we if were to look at the story, we are not certain who Noah's wife was. Sarah plays an essential part in the honest enough of Abraham. What was the name of Isaac's wife? Anybody? Rebecca. Rebecca? Oh plays an essential role in development of the story. Jacob has two wives and some concubines. His two wives in particular, in particular Rachel becomes important in the story. We don't remember Joseph's wives or wife. Okay. 
we don't but she's also a very important character and if we could have stopped to look at at um who she might have been you'd be surprised does anybody know who joseph's wife might have been no nope. she was an egyptian isn't it? she's was... an egyptian yeah all right here is the thing and it just suddenly opens a lot of possibilities Asanet was her name. Yes, but who was she? Um, the wife, she was the mother she of the priest. She, priest she was a daughter of the priest by the name of? Yeah, she was the daughter of the priest. Is Potiphera the same as Potiphar? We don't know. No, no. You don't know? You'd no. be surprised to think that many Bible scholars, maybe most believe that they're the same. Potiphar and Potiphar are the same person. Okay? If that is so, what are the implications? I mean, David Martin, was it Martin into royalty? Yeah, but you're, but you're forgetting the story. That's right, he marries into royalty. Yeah, he's married to the daughter of the woman who falsely <laughs> accused him of rape. Oh, okay. Doesn't God have a sense of humor? Of yeah. course, he does. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no, I'm not saying that's a possibility. We're not really yeah. certain, right? Wasn't Patifala really... a general in the army? He the was a high official, mm -hmm. but we don't know what that means. Anyway, and Moses is there, Moses' wife, Zipporah. Mm -hmm. um, we do not know much about her except that she was a Kushite woman, which mm -hmm. more than that may actually mean that she was a black woman. And it adds interest to the story because when Moses' sister, sister Miriam, Miriam was angry at Moses that he had married to this Cushite woman. God struck her with leprosy that made her skin white. <laughs> so you, 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 you don't like black people? All right, be white. No, that's very interesting because the Hebrews themselves are not white. Okay, they were more brown or olive people. Like yellow. So, oh, yeah, so she suddenly became white. Since you want to be white, take white. You know? So the, the, the women, there are key women in the story. Perhaps not key in the same way, but they add a lot to the story and make the story so much more interesting as we move forward. I think we should add Tamar to that list. Who? Oh, Tamar, right. Right. Good, 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 good. Yes. So some key themes, judgment. You see that happening throughout the, the first five books. Judgment is something close at hand. Redemption. Redemption is not just a New Testament concept. It's an Old Testament concept of God constantly reaching out to his people to, to take them out of bad situations. The people of God, Israel as the people of God, becomes a very, very important concept. The idea of covenant is also important and in the first five books we have at least two covenants at least two there may, may be many more okay two major covenants at least we see the covenant of abraham and the covenant with israel and there are two different covenants that are extremely important in our understanding of the development of the biblical message and then there's also the idea of promise does anybody know the first promise in the bible not to send rain to destroy the earth. No, before that. It was a promise that Abraham, when he said, I will get, uh, make your, um, you have many children. Long said. before that. Before that? Before the seed. Yes, the seed of the woman. Jesus. Oh, okay. The seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. Say go. Right. Will yeah. crush his head and he shall strike her heel. Okay, which we believe to be a uh, a promise of the coming Messiah. That is in Genesis chapter 3. Okay. 
All right, so let's go to, the, to each of the books. By the time, what time are we supposed to finish, by the way? Jermaine? Want to finish this, this section by, by about 8, 8.20? Okay. For so, yeah, let's, let's fly then. Okay. So let's look at Genesis. Genesis is a book that talks about a God of promise. It is also the book of beginnings, and it describes the creation and gives a history of the old world and of the step, steps taken by God towards the formation of a theocracy. Okay? Um, in the book of Genesis, we see all of that happening. Okay? Um, but it is also a story that tells us of the repeated incidents of the failure of the people of God. This becomes a recurring theme. And all that God is doing with the people, they are constantly failing him. Right? And there is a brief outline. I will send the PowerPoint to, to German at the end, and he can share it with you guys, right? But you, we could have divided this book in many, many ways. This is just a big outline. Starts a prologue, creation of heaven and earth. And it talks about the account of heaven and earth, two to four. Um, the account of Adam, the account of Noah and his sons, and then Abraham, the account of Isaac, Esau, and Jacob. So of the seven people we mentioned, six, six are prominent in this. We perhaps could have, should have, no, well, Genesis doesn't have anything about Moses. So we can't add Moses to this list. Okay? But look at the story as you read along. And you're going to see that the here it is that look at the, the, the ideas on the left of the screen. You see these things happening. And they are purposefully captured for us. Okay? Repeated incidents of God, of the failure of the people of God is an extremely important theme but it doesn't stand alone because that stands alongside for instance the idea of a god of promise he's going to keep his word even when his people are failing so let's move on any questions on that okay exodus now, this is not just a God of promise, not a God who put things in place and make a promise. But Exodus, and he doesn't change, by the way. He's just, it's just that here is something that's being added. He is the God of power. And he's going to deliver his people out of bondage. We know the story how the children of Israel had gone down into Egypt because of famine and how J Joseph had created the environment for them to thrive in Egypt. But then there came a time when there was a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph, and he put the people in bondage. The God of power is the God of deliverance who comes eventually and he del delivers the people out of bondage after their many years in slavery. How long were they in slavery again? Anybody knows? 400 years. What she said? 430. 400, 430. Anybody else? 430. Okay. So we say approximately 400 years. 430, yes. Approximately 400 years in slavery. And God comes and he will deliver them. So it is talking about the history of Israel's departure from Egypt. And we know that. Um, it's a part of the Old Testament that we have read a lot about that Passover night, the end of the, t of the ten plagues in Egypt, where the death of the firstborn and how God delivered all households that had the lamb, the blood of the lamb painted over the doorposts and the lintels. Okay? How those homes were delivered. Okay? And then, and that becomes, by the way, let me just take this off a little bit. And that idea becomes an extremely important idea for the coming of the Messiah. In the New Testament, 
when Jesus comes, he comes as the Passover lamb. So this is one place in the Old Testament, one of the many places that point to the coming of Jesus. Okay? We talk, it talks about the giving of the law. A most misunderstood part of the book of Exodus and perhaps of the whole Bible is that many people still think the law was given as a means of ensuring that the people could be good enough to be accepted by God. What we see happening is that the giving of the law only showed up Israel's sin more. Okay? We saw the idea of the tabernacle, which again speaks to the coming of the Messiah. John 1 tells us that Jesus came and he tabernacled with us as the <coughs> Spirit of God, as God himself came and dwelt in the tabernacle from time to time. <coughs> the coming of Jesus is likened unto that. He comes in the flesh and he dwells among his people. And introduces Moses as the most important character in Israel. In fact, Moses becomes the most important character in the history of Israel, uh, even more important than Abraham. <coughs> um, Paul will try to change it around to make Abraham more important. Okay? But in saying that Moses is more important than Abraham doesn't mean that Abraham wasn't important to the Jews. It's that Moses as a lawgiver was the one who, who set the foundation for them as a nation. And here is a brief outline. God delivers his people, the Exodus. God leads his people, the wilderness testing. <coughs> there they should have spent a very short time in the wilderness. They end up spending 40 years. And this is because of the disobedience. God and Israel enter covenant. And this is a different covenant from the covenant made with Abraham. Covenant made with Abraham was what we call a unilateral covenant where God signed an oath with himself. Okay? The covenant made with Israel is a bilateral covenant where they both bound themselves by oath. And any one of them who broke the covenant would not um, normally expect the other to keep his part. The covenant was invalidated when one party broke it. Okay, in a bilateral covenant. Israel constantly broke the covenant. Yet still God never broke his part. He continued like a lovesick husband who's seen a cheating wife. He's constantly going back after her. As we come to see in the book of Hosea, the picture of Hosea and Goma. Okay? And God reveals the pattern of the tabernacle and its ministry. And we'll come to understand more about the tabernacle ministry and so on, the worship of Israel, Israel's rebellion, judgment, and restoration. And we see a big idea of the erection, the preparation, the erection of the tabernacle. Again, I ask, is there anybody who have any questions or comments right now? All right, write them down. Leviticus, one of the most difficult books of the Old Testament to read. It, along with numbers, portions are very difficult to read. Okay. Yeah. But the emphasis is not on a God of promise or a God of power, even though those things are still important, but a God of purity. Okay. And it's a book of instruction regarding the ceremonial law. And here's a brief outline. The laws of sacrifice, chapters 1 to 7. Institution of the priesthood, 8 to 10. Uncleanness, un uncleanness and its treatment, 11 to 16. Practice of holiness, 17 to 27. Okay? So this is one of the books of the Bible that I don't have to ask about, you mm. about. I know that many of you have not read more than a few verses from the book of Leviticus. Usually the verses you read have to do with the food laws. Isn't that so? If you're Adventist. All right. Well, I know if you can eat pork or not. <laughs> Don't eat pork, though. You must eat pork. Just bring it to me. But, oh, I'll dispose of it for you. I want to know if you're a pig. Yeah? 
What's that? Oh, come here, saying something. I heard somebody say something. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, uh, um, David. I was. Uh, I just heard someone. Somebody said something. Anyway, move yeah. forward. So let's go to the book of Numbers. Another difficult book to read because you have these long sections just recounting the names of people, and the numbers from each clan and so on. And when you get to those sections, I know what people do. Then reach that verse, then just push them finger over the paper, write down until them go to another narrative section and then move on. And just jump over the names. Okay? The God speaks of a God of perseverance. This is a God who doesn't give up on his people. <clears throat> God of promise, God of power, God of purity. He's a God of perseverance. Okay? Mm -hmm. And here, the journeys the people of God are recounted through the desert. Through the desert. And it talks about the census of the people, counting the people. You know, which is a very controversial thing among scholars. We do want to know. We want to know if we must take the numbers seriously or take them literally. Literally is right, but not seriously. We take the numbers literally. <laughs> when you take the numbers, we estimate that about 2 million people left, is, left Egypt. Other scholars say that that is not possible. 2 million people could not survive in the desert for 40 years. Some people say it's a big big debate but the idea comes because of the census of god people and how we are to understand it okay story of the wilderness wanderings are also important okay and i mentioned one more publisher i've mentioned one of the clearest promises of the coming messiah is found in the book of numbers and it is recaptured in the book of Mark mm -hmm. of the Good Shepherd. Mm -hmm. God will provide a good shepherd. I think it may be number 17 or thereabouts, right? That is recaptured almost exactly <clears throat> using the very similar words, I should say, in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 6, to show that Jesus is the one who was promised by God in the book of Numbers. And here's a brief outline. Preparation for the journey through the wilderness, 1-1 one, one to 10-10. Ten, ten. From Sinai to the plains of Moab, 10-11 to 20-1. And then the Balaam incident. Mm -hmm. You guys know about Balaam, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was paid to curse the, mm -hmm. the children of Israel. And every time he went to curse them, he pronounced a blessing. On them, yeah. Very interesting story, right? Mm -hmm. And it tells about the preparation for entering into Canaan. All right? Um, you can go and you can read those stories for yourself and you see these things coming. Let's go to the final book of the Pentateuch, which is Deuteronomy. Um, maybe can I ask a question? Um, no, you can ask. But it's probably don't make sense, but... Okay, so we have these long list genealogies in the in the book of um, Numbers. I'm um, surely they're not there for just filling the space. What should right. we make up? What's the value? Well, um, we don't understand the value until we see our name in a list. Okay, I I work part time with CGST right now helping them in their theology department. And I was preparing some documents for them. And I had to go back and look at some historical data. And guess who name, whose name I see in the historical data? A man by the name of David Pearson. Mm -hmm. I said, wow, isn't that interesting? Mm. Okay. We oftentimes overlook these things, but to a people, at a particular time, when their name is recalled, it says to them that they are not unimportant. Mm -hmm. In a world that was enamored by nobility and by power and prominence, 
every person is recorded. Mm -hmm. Okay? And even though we might not see the significance of, we not understand the each and every name, you look at them and you see some names that you can recognize and you can recognize the families that you're coming from, some of them. It perhaps teaches us a lesson that we need to be a little bit more mindful about the small man in church, small woman, the little woman, little person, okay, whose contribution to the work of God is vitally important. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's one way I, I will answer the question, Uncle Maurice. So I don't know if that is sufficient for you. Uh, it makes make some bit of more sense than I had, you know. Yeah, okay. everybody's important. Yeah, it is, it is. And we say the same thing in the book of Nehemiah. You know? yeah. In the book of Nehemiah, a man is mentioned, he's a candlestick maker. Okay. A candlestick maker. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Now, we, we, what's so great about a candlestick? I mean? You couldn't, you couldn't, couldn't hold a candle without the stick. Uh, uh, that is one, yeah. But also, it, it helps to provide light at night. Yeah. Okay. It's not in our minds. It's not as an Im important as the uh, uh, as the the priest or the prophet or you know I mean some other somebody who built the temple and so on. But guess what? Unless the woman come and sweep the church on Sunday morning, I mean before Sunday morning, many are not meant to like it at all. Place full of cobweb and dust, and the table, the Lord's table is dirty and so on. You're not going to like it. But we often overlook the little people, and we learn from these things that we mustn't do. All right, let's come down because time is David, going. David, yes, just to add to, to that, um, as you made a point, it came to mind that I mean, for Israel, their history was such a big part of who they are, too. Right. Tracing their genealogies back to to the different tribes and so on. Right. Um, so for Matthew, for for Joseph and Mary, they knew which tribe they came from and they were able to trace back their genealogy. Right, right. Um, yeah. Thank you. Well, yes, and Richie, I think I heard you. Yeah, similarly, it's important in establishing the credibility of Jesus. Right. As being descended from David as well. Yes, we see that as one of the importance of, the, of one at least one genealogy in the in the um, Old Testament. But those things are very very important. Yes, again, unfortunately for us as a Caribbean people, the Caribbean family has been so decimated by ravages of history and wicked people and so on that we don't have a good appreciation of our family heritage. Most of us don't. We can't tell you who our great grandparents were. Most of us can't. Many of us can't even tell you who our father was or is. I had a plumber working in my house in a project for the last few weeks. And today I discovered that he's a brother of someone who my sister my wife grew up with. Uh -huh. Okay? And he's laughing when he heard him. So don't worry about it. I discovered that he's my brother last year. Okay? The man is 50 or 52. Last year, he discovered one of his brothers who's a professor in a university in the USA. All right? But this is what has happened in a country or in a region, because it's not Jamaica alone, me living in Tobago, and being exposed to other places in the Eastern Caribbean, I have come to realize that this is a part of Caribbean family patterns among Negro in stock, among people from, you know, from, from African heritage mainly, in that their families were decimated, were destroyed. And that has been a part of our legacy that we have not, re we have not recaptured the importance of family. And it's one of the reasons why we see so much of the devastation among our people that we are experiencing. Okay? Thanks, thanks David. Yeah. I, I can appreciate that now I'm reflecting on, I, when I go down to, sometime when I'm in Montego Bay, I go to the Sam Sharp Square, where mm -hmm. they have the of the slaves. Right. And some of them don't have any name. They, they have, they're known from plantation, so and so, 
slave yes. number so and so belong to slave master so and so. Yeah, yes. I can appreciate that now. And that's one of the reasons why the church in the Caribbean has to place a greater emphasis on family. Okay? A greater emphasis. I have some very radical theories about family now in the church. I don't any any young girl in the community who gets pregnant out of wedlock, I think the church should seek them out and make them a part of the, part of our our body. Not necessarily as members, but we should take care of them. Okay? Because it is the love that we show to them that's going to help them to understand the importance of love moving forward for children. And they will start to see something among us, even though for many of us this wasn't ever present enough. Don't get me wrong enough. Many of us are learning by a trial and error. But we have to find a way to reconnect with family and make it an important part of our, of our existence. Okay? Not just existence, an important part of our survival. Right. Let's move to Deuteronomy. It's a God of preparation. Preparation for what, by the way? Entering to the promised land. Preparation for entering to the promised land. An important idea here is obedience. You're going to see Moses repeat the law. The word Deuteronomy means second law, by the way. Moses is repeating the law. He's reading it again. He's telling the people what it means to obey God as you go into the promised land. He's emphasizing it. And guess what? They are going to go into the promised land and, and ignore it. And that is for next week. So he rehearses the law. And it also tells us the death of Moses, which is a big problem in the book of Deuteronomy. Because if Moses wrote Deuteronomy, how can he write about his own death? Any suggestions? Joshua wrote the end. Okay, that's one nice suggestion. <laughs> Somebody told I really them. mean that. That's a good suggestion. Any, any other suggestion? Never thought of it. Never thought about it. I remember when um when I was a student at JTS back in the mid eighties, I heard a view that really didn't didn't fit just didn't sit sit, sit well with me. That God used Moses to write about his own death before he died. And I said, no, that might be possible, but to me that just seems contrived. I think most people believe that the the content of Deuteronomy is Moses' content. But what was happening is that somebody else, maybe Joshua, as was mentioned earlier, or somebody else has written it down and when it comes to the last part it moves from a kind of first person account into a third person account okay kind of an understanding like that brief outline introduction moses first address an interlude of the cities of refuge very very important idea of the cities of refuge one day we perhaps should do a study on that and see what are the implications for us. You know, um, one time in Jamaica, churches were places of refuge. I don't know if that holds anymore because people go in church and kill people. Then you have Moses' second address and a reiteration of the law, Moses' third address, and the conclusion of Moses' ministry. So you see, Deuteronomy is largely about Moses giving the law again. Each time after he addresses, then you have an interlude which tells us of other things which are important. Okay. Now, how does this point to Christ? I think I've been intimating a little bit before. Right? One of the things is that Genesis introduces the idea of mankind's fall. And this is just a brief overview, right? And then it illustrates man's inability to do as he knows he should. Okay, beginning with Cain and continuing through all mankind. We know that Adam and Eve fell, but we don't get the sense that they are unable to obey God until you come to Cain. Okay? Cain is just this, this 
the archetype almost of the sinner. And guess what? After Cain, people start progressively become worse. Okay? Now, when we come to the, even the patriarchs, we see the patriarchs are very flawed people. Man's inability to, to do as he knows he should. But it also demonstrates to us our God of mercy and lays the foundation for sacrifice on behalf of mankind. It's always building to something, you know. The Pentateuch, the Torah, whatever you want to call it, it is showing us the failures of mankind in light of a very merciful God. And then the story is unfolding the birth of the sacrificial system on behalf of mankind which is a prediction of the coming of Jesus. So in this way, we can see how the books of Moses point to the importance of Messiah, of why he needed to come to help us. Paul will pick up on this in the book of Galatians, and he will tell you the law is a schoolmaster because we were not able to obey it. It was there to show us our need for a savior. Now let me do a quick excursus as an illustration. An excursus is just a little digression at the end to illustrate what I have just been saying. The story of Jacob is a fascinating story in the book of Genesis. Okay? You remember he was dubbed a trickster at birth. Right? How many of you knew that this was a family trait? Coming from his wife, not with his wife, from his mother, and coming from her from her brother, mm. Laban. Laban. If you go back, you'll see when when Abraham sent his servant to find a wife for Isaac, and you go and you trace the story, you look at the story, you will see that when uh, obviously their father was dead or he was very ill because Laban is not the head of the family. When Laban saw the gold and saw the bracelets and so on <laughs> that his that this man had brought as a promissory note okay for caring for Rebecca his eyes lit up and he gladly put her gave her away like that. But he couldn't have forced her to go. She chose to go. Now, we see her doing a similar thing, okay? Um, when her sons were born, Esau and Jacob, okay? You remember that? They were, Jacob was holding on to the heel. Oh, God. Was he holding on him? Yes, right? And he was called a supplanter, a trickster, one who's going to take what is not really his. We see how that story developed and how Rebecca facilitated the, the, the idea in, in Jacob that he could take what wasn't his. All right? So he has this lifetime of scamming to survive. When, he, when his brother Ether threatens to kill him, again his mother comes to his rescue and she concocts a, pl a, a, a plan for him to go and live with Uncle Laban, who we already know is a trickster. And guess what? <laughs> when he was going, he bargained with God for his protection. Now, this is a key part of the story. He was at this place that he called Bethel. All right? He was sleeping at night, his head on a rock. Okay? When he had this vision of, of angels coming down a ladder, up and down um, from heaven, coming down from heaven and going back up. And he said that he met God there. And he said to God, if you take me to my uncle Laban, and if you prosper me, and if you bring me back to my homeland, then I will serve you. You will be not only my father's God, you will be my God. So he's bargaining with God for protection and provision. And guess what? 
he goes to his uncle Laban and him scam out Laban. Laban scam him, him scam him back. Him is a better scammer. Right? Now, here is the part of the story I find interesting. And my time is coming to the end quickly. All right? Part of the story I find very interesting is that there is this sudden, suddenly on his return back home, okay, as he, on his return home, he is so afraid of what his brother Esau is going to do, it, do to him that he starts to plan another scam to get around Esau. You might look at that story. Go and you read that story. You'll see how he, how he took from his large flock that he had scammed out from his uncle. How much he'd send, he'd send the flock ahead in three portions. And each time he would send servants along with them. And this last portion, he'd come with his own children. He'd come with Rachel and, and send his concubines before with their children. And the last portion, he'd come with his own children. And with, the, with his preferred children, Rachel would look, he loved. Okay, that's the plan he made to go. So he sits down that, and he's still not very convinced that it's going to work. So here's a part of the story that we sometimes don't understand, and I'm going to give you a perspective on it. The night before he knows he's going to meet his brother, he's fretting so much that he 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 puts his closest family members in camp, and he goes across the Jabbok River to be have a time alone. He's fretting and can't sleep. And there he encounters God. And the passage tells us that he wrestles with God all night. And in the morning, when he, when God couldn't prevail over him, he told God, I won't. God said, let me go. He said, I won't, you won't let it go until you bless me. And God blessed him and touched him upon him hip. Blessed him by changing his name. Now, what does that story mean? I'm going to give you a suggestion. My suggestion is that on his way back home, when he is very restless that night and he goes across the Java River, God appears to him and God says, you have not lived up to your part of the bargain. You bargain with me that you must protect me, that I must protect you and provide for you. And that when you come home, you will serve me, but you are not serving me. So I'm demanding that you hold your part of the bargain tonight. I'm right, right here. And he refused. And the wrestling with God, I don't necessarily believe it is as physical as we make it out to be. It's a night of wrestling, perhaps in prayer and dialogue. And he, God is hounding him and he is not giving in. And then in the morning, in some way, shape or form, God detains him that he can't move until he gives in and when he gives in he says to god i'm not going to i'm not going to let you go now i'm going to go after this this thing now until you free me and you blip with a blessing and god blesses him and touches him on his hip god changes his name and he's no longer called scammer trickster he's now called israel okay is, I think it means man of God, man heard of God, or man, man, something like that it means, right? His name is changed, his character changes. And that for me is a picture of the redemption that comes through Jesus. That when God takes us and he makes us into something new, we are no longer like what we were. Now, let me tell you one interesting thing and then we'll close off and then take you. In the Old Testament, almost every time you see reference to the children of Jacob, when Israel are called the children of Jacob, they're speaking about their sinfulness. Okay? When they're called the children of Israel, most time it is talking about God's promise. They are the children of God at that time, the people of God. But children of Jacob, okay, when God calls Israel Jacob, it's almost derogatory speaking about them as evil people. That changes when God changed his name because there's a change in his character. He's meet, he meets God and is converted by God's mercy and grace. 
Any questions? Let me close off the mic. I have a question. Sure, um, go ahead, Gino. What's your take on the view that Genesis, they'll give credit to Moses for Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But some don't give him credit for Genesis, especially the first few chapters there, saying he would have got it from the Egyptians or the Jews would have got it while they were in Babylon. So Genesis, they said, don't really have an art about, like for the first few chapters, they don't give him credit for those being the, the length of time that it took place and him getting information. Um, um, first of all, there is recent evidence that suggests that the idea that, that Israel got their accounts first from from um from egypt and other places might be overblown one of the things that is usually mentioned is that at this point in time that is the genesis israel were not a literate people they had no writing skills or reading skills we are finding discoveries today which suggests which may suggest that israel had a developed alphabet before Egypt did. Okay? And so it is causing many scholars to reassess much of their original beliefs regarding Israel's dependence on other people. Okay? There are some who believe that Israel perhaps has the oldest alphabet around. Um, Another way of understanding it is that even if people hadn't written down ideas from before, it doesn't mean that they had, didn't have the ideas. Because ideas exist by oral tradition, and oral tradition just doesn't mean by word of mouth. Yes, by word of mouth, but by in different ways. They pass on knowledge through songs, through poems, through speeches, okay, and so on. And so it could be that these ideas existed in Israel in an oral form, oral or written, long before. But much of the idea that we, that the Jews borrowed from, from, from the Egyptians is based on the idea that the Egyptians were literate before the Egyptians, before the Israelites. And we are saying that that is being challenged even today. There's a video series uh, that I have seen a 10 part video series on this matter. If I can find out the series, I'll share the link with you. Okay. And um, my church subscribes to this Christian site that gives you all these resources free. And I can share it. I can share it with anybody who can freely um, look at the videos and, and the thing. I, I, if I can find the link again, I search for the link and I'll share it with you. All right, Martina, thank you. That's the best All way I can answer the question. All right, thank you. Have a text in the chat. Yes. The second yes. one. Wait, wait, let's let let's look on the first one, um, Anne Marie. Because the first one is how how do you David hear me? Yeah, I'm hearing you. Okay. Um I mean it was a point that sometimes first look to the old testament to 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 decide what they should eat and what they shouldn't. Right. Nice. Um yeah. So, so, to, to what extent, to what extent should the Old Testament guide us in what we eat, or generally, it, do we? Is is that something we may, may replace the New Testament? To what extent should the Old Testament guide us? Um, in right. Because I noticed that there was a difference between the statement in the New Testament and the Old Testament. So it was kind of confusing at one point. Yeah. Yeah. Um. um it, it, we, we have to go and look at the purpose of the Old Testament laws first. When we understand the purpose of the laws, okay. then we can better appreciate what happens to those laws in the New Testament. Some of the laws were, the, the word is abrogated, meaning that they were fulfilled and, and um, no longer relevant when it comes to the New Testament. The, the Old Testament dietary laws, and by the way, all these questions are very difficult to answer. There are no easy answers to them, right? I'm, I'm being very upfront with you. The Old Testament dietary laws 
there is a feeling that um, it was meant, they were meant to, to set the Israelites apart from idolatrous practices of the, of the nations around them. Okay? And it was never mean, meant as a means of holiness. Personal holiness. Okay? In other words, like the rest of the laws, no matter how hard you try to keep them, that's not how you became holy. But what, what God was teaching the people was that there was a standard that he required of them to set them apart from the idolatrous practices of them. Okay? There came a time, however, when those laws were no longer important to teach that lesson. All right? And then when Jesus came, his whole thing was that, remember, purity is not external. We can't force purity on you by a law. Purity is what's on the inside. It is what's on the inside that comes out and shows it to be pure. So we see that fascinating passage in Mark 7 that speaks about, speaks about this and all that, that in saying this, Jesus declared all meats clean. Mark 7, about nine, verse 19. That was a story about Jesus' and disciples eating unwashed hands. And the Pharisees were upset, you know. Why are they defiling themselves? And Jesus said to them, don't you realize that's not what goes into you that makes you unclean, but what comes out? Out of the heart comes all kinds of evil and so on. And then Mark the Evangelist says, in saying this, Jesus declared all meets clean. Now, what do you make, how do you make sense of that? I have a very developed teaching on that passage that based on the idea that Mark is Peter's gospel, the traditional idea that Mark wrote Peter's gospel. And Peter is using the gospel to justify his eating with Cornelius. Okay? And to justify, not justify is a strong word, but to explain his eating with, at Cornelius' house. And even then to go on to explain much of what happened in um, Acts 15 at Jerusalem Council, where the laws that were, were the church was asked to, 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 to continue to follow never had food laws in them at all. And it goes on to explain Justify Paul's position in Galatians chapter 2 when Paul challenged Peter, who suddenly started to live like a Jew when the men from Jerusalem came. You know that story, right? And Paul challenged him and called him a hypocrite. Because the truth is that Peter was not living like a Jew among the Galatians, which means what? Yeah, he poked too. So, um, not to cut you short, but one quick question. So, are you saying Sorry. that the only time we we, should, we really need to be a bit conscious is in the time of length when we um, decide to eat very little meat or no meat at all? Or no, just I'm not fish? saying that at all. I okay. think I think freedom to eat doesn't mean that we must eat. And there are some times when, for health reasons, there are some foods we perhaps should eat right. and some we shouldn't eat. Right. Okay. Lent is not a biblical teaching. Lent is a, a church teaching from the Roman Catholic Church. But many people have found it to be a useful practice for spiritual discipline. And the 40 days between Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, they use as a time to purge themselves of things that they find to be unhelpful in their own physical or spiritual development. And so they don't eat meat. Some of them they don't eat particular types of meat, you know, during that time. And that's not a biblical teaching. It's a church teaching. All right? But I'm not saying that because we can eat, we should eat. All right? There are other reasons. Okay? All right. Thanks, David. We take one more question. I really wanted him, not to cut you, Uncle Jeremy, but I really wanted him to touch a little bit on the second text regarding young girls. Wait a minute. No, wait. I want to train up. I just want to, I want to, want, if there are other questions first, because you had one already. So if there are any right, other no questions. Problem. Cool. 
Any other questions? David, you can just explain the whole thing of cities of refuge. Okay. A city of refuge was a concept that um, provided an opportunity for justice for, the, for, the, for those who were falsely accused of murder. Okay? Now, remember in this day, there's no police force. Right? And a man come and say, somebody say that you, you are accused of murder or you're accused of a capital crime. Okay? If you know that you were innocent, you could run to a city of refuge. And in the city of refuge, they'd have to hear your case. They would have to hear your case. It was a way of stopping jungle justice from getting to you. Okay, if you knew that you were innocent. So that was the idea about the city of refuge. Okay. Um, um, even the idea of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That was an idea to stop jungle justice. Well, that was the law of equal justice, right? Lex talionis, the law of equal justice. What it said is that if a man thief a goat, you can't kill him for that. Right? If a man steals a goat, he should be asked to pay back for the goat. Okay? The, the punishment should not exceed the crime. Yeah, yeah. I find that we need eye for an eye law in Jamaica. We misunderstand it because we listen to Mahatma Gandhi, okay, and repeated by Martin Luther King Jr. Mahatma Gandhi says, an eye for an eye, not Martin Luther King, um, Malcolm X. An eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. Malcolm X mentions that. In other words, when you start to take revenge, okay, an eye for an eye is teaching you that you must take revenge. That's not what it was teaching you. It was teaching that you must temper justice yeah. okay, with mercy. If a man steals from you, he must repay what he has stolen. He mustn't kill it. Yeah? That was the same thing with the city of refuge. Similar idea. All right, thank you. And we were just asking your opinion, David, on you mentioned the issue of pregnant girls getting pregnant girls being taken to church. Right. She's asking, don't you think the same love should be shown to young girls that get pregnant in high school to let them stay in school to yes. further their education? Yes, I agree, except I know why, I understand why the principals don't want them to come back in the same school. Okay? Because they become a kind of a encouragement to other girls to do the Are same. But I believe that we should find ways of keeping them in school and that they can further their education. I 100% agree with that. I also believe that young men who get them pregnant should face the consequences of their actions and they should start to help to provide for those children from now. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, if you have any questions, please, um, you can save them um, you can, or send them to us. We'll get them to David. I remember on Sunday as well, there's a time for Q&A at the end of um, the presentation um, as we learn together. Again, thank you, David. Very interesting. He, he will repost the, the PowerPoint um, on, on our channel below where you'll find his videos. So all, all that is there. It's a lot of digest. You can go and review it. Remember, you have to go and review it, family, so we can learn. All right. So thanks again. I'm just going to close right now. David, just want to close in prayer for us. Okay, let's pray now. Sure. Father, we thank you again for your word. We ask that you continue to teach us, not just for head knowledge, you know, not just for this understanding that we can pack up ourselves with all these great kind of ideas, but we want them to change our lives for the better. We want to please you in our actions. We know that pleasing you is not the way to salvation. It is through your grace 
know, a faith in your gracious act to us through Jesus Christ, that we come to this place of, of benefiting from you. But we pray as we continue to look at your word that you will give us a greater revelation of Jesus, who to know his life and truth. Thanks again for this day, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, family. Thank you.